Hello, I'm Tamsin Cornell, Executive Director of the Brewster Historical Society. We're pleased to present this art history talk by Beth Stein as she interprets the art of Howard Gibbs. Beth Stein has been educating adult audiences on the lives and works of famous artists for the past 15 years on Cape Cod and in New Jersey. She received her BS in education from Indiana University, an MA in history from Seton Hall University, and an MA in administration and supervision from Montclair State University. She has been involved in the world of education for 40 years, working as a high school teacher, district and private school administrator, and college professor. In October of 2003, she was named runner-up for the New Jersey Council for the Humanities Teacher of the Year Award and was formally recognized by the New Jersey State Legislature and Governor Cody for this achievement. In May of 2004, she was the recipient of the Innovations in Special Education Award from the New Jersey School Board's Association and the Association of Schools and Agencies for the Handicapped. In her retirement, Beth presented illustrated talks on a variety of art history topics at adult schools, libraries, museums, and community centers in New Jersey and since 2015, continues to do so at various venues on Cape Cod. In addition, she is the current chair of the Development Committee for Brewster Historical Society in Brewster, Massachusetts. Without further ado, here is Beth Stein. Thank you, Tamsin, for that lovely introduction, and welcome to all members and non-members of the Brewster Historical Society. Today, we're gonna to do um, a little jaunt into the art of Howard Gibbs, Brewster artist. Um, the art world is full of unsung heroes, true originals who perhaps shown briefly, but who've slipped through the cracks of history. But the paintings of Howard Gibbs, which were really developed from um, his personal blend of surrealist expressionism are unique and worthy of really wider recognition. So it's my pleasure to put together this PowerPoint on Howard Gibbs. This is a photo of the Swain School of Design um, where Howard Gibbs attended as a student. Howard Manning Gibbs Jr. was born in New Bedford in 1904. And as I said, he attended the Swain School of Design. Um, it started off as the Swain Free School of New Bedford, Massachusetts. It was established in 1881 through the provisions of the will of New Bedford, New Bedford philanthropist William W. Swain, hence the name. The following year, it began offering courses in languages, literature, history, education, art, and chemistry free of charge to area residents who could not otherwise afford an education beyond public school. They were required to put down a deposit of $10 per semester as a measure of good faith. Oh, for the days of that, right? As the textile industry became increasingly important to the area, the school concentrated on instruction in textile design. In 1902, the trustees re redefined its mission as a school of design with the purpose of providing a more complete and thorough course of instruction in the fundamental principles of design that had, then had ever been given in this city and to provide also instruction in the practical application of these principles in all branches of decorative art. And that's, I wanted to share that with you because that's the connection for Howard Gibbs. Now, just to wrap it into modern day, in 1988, the Swain School of Design merged with Southeastern Massachusetts University's College of Visual and Performing Arts, and it's now part of the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. I love this picture. This is a photo of Gibbs from the Swain School of Design when he was a student, and Gibbs is the one right here far left, back row. Love his hairdo also. But that is our man, Howard Gibbs, Jr. Okay. Uh, these are two of his earlier paintings um, from, and they're both entitled Bermuda Street, and they're called that because they were painted in Bermuda. Gibbs left home when he was 18 and went to Bermuda. 
He'd saved enough money to go to Bermuda and stayed there probably six or eight months. He painted and he also taught there. After he returned, his great-grandmother sent him to France, where he stayed for two years. Now, why France? Well, in those days, the center of the art world was Paris. And anybody who was an aspiring artist went to Paris to complete their art training. Um, you could learn only so much in America. Uh, we were considered provincial. By, by comparison to what was going on in a good deal of Europe and especially in Paris. So to be sent to Paris was really, the, had to be the pinnacle of his aspirations at that time. He stayed in France for two years. He came back and he lived in Harwich and was very involved with the Provincetown Art Association. Now, I just want to tell you, just to give you an idea of size here, is that, um, these paintings, the one on the left is really just about 12 inches by 12 inches, so they're not large. This one on the right is about 18 inches by 16 inches, so his early works are not very large. They do get some, somewhat larger as we go on, but I want to also point out the wonderful use of color and line that he has in his paintings there. This is a still life by Howard Gibbs called Still Life with Sugar Bowl, painted um, around 1925. And when I saw it, I thought of two things. I thought of the use of outlining that was largely used by the post-impressionists that I'm sure he must have studied when he went to France. But what really jumped out at me um, uh, more prominently was the likeness to a Cezanne still life. And I'm sure that he was exposed to the work of Cezanne when he was in France. Um, so I decided to compare them. And I think you can see why. <laughs> um, as I read the description of, of Cezanne's work to you, I want you to your eye to go back and forth between the work of Cezanne and the work of Gibbs. And I think you uh, will see how closely they are related. Cezanne said, the eye must grasp, bring things together. The brain will give it shape. Cezanne, by the way, is known as the father of modern art because he was the first one to really use geometry in art and to change the perspective, the way that we view things. Let me go on. In a still life where the artist also creates the world he paints, each object, each placement, each viewpoint represents a decision. Cezanne painted and repainted the objects pictured here many times. He was known for that. He literally perseverated over every apple, every peach, every napkin until it reached perfection for him. Every different arrangement was a new exploration of forms and their relationships. Here the table tilts unexpectedly and I want you to look at Gibbs's work. You see how it looks as though the fruits should be falling off, as well as the same thing in Cezanne, but they don't. Here the table tilts unexpectedly, defying traditional rules of perspective. Similarly, we see the picture in profile, but are also allowed to look down into it. Well, you don't look into um, Gibbs's sugar bowl, but if you look at the flower vase, I think you get the same description as Cezanne's picture. Cezanne worked slowly and deliberately. Over the course of days, he would move his easel, painting different objects, or even the same one, from different points of view. Each time, he painted what he saw. And again, just go back and forth between the two for a moment, and you'll see that Gibbs borrowed, if you will, many of the principles of Cezanne. Well, when he went to France in 1927, because he came back and he went again, this time he studied with an artist named Edmond Francois Amon Jean, whose portrait on the left was painted by Georges Seurat, Seurat. And one of the reasons that Seurat painted that is he and uh, Amon Jean were roommates together when they were young, aspiring artists. 
Now, Amaz Jean was a noted artist of the day who straddled the art worlds of symbolism and art nouveau. And the work on the right by Amaz Jean, Young Girl with Peacock, I chose that because I wanted you to, I think it incorporates both the art of symbolism and art nouveau. And I'm just going to briefly describe both of those to you. And the reason I want to do this is he was the teacher of Gibbs. So surely what Amand Jean used in his art was taken into the world of Gibbs as he became a painter. Symbolism was at the forefront of modernism in that it developed new and often abstract means to express psychological truth and the idea that behind the physical world lay a spiritual reality. So you have reality and you have the spirit, spiritual reality. Symbolists could take dreams and visions and give them form. So that's important to remember because as we get into the wor work of Gibbs, you're going to see that he doesn't always paint things as they are in reality. Okay. Now, Art Nouveau, which I'm sure many of you have heard of, was an ornamental style of art that flourished between about 1890 and 1910 throughout Europe and e eventually even the United States. And the distinguishing characteristic of it was its undulating lines, often taking the form of flower stalks and buds, vine tendrils, insect wings, and other delicate and sinuous natural objects. And I think you can see that in this painting, the peacock, the curves, the beautiful way her scarf blows in the breeze, the curve up here of the garden or the, the park in which this is taking place. Um, the line may be elegant and graceful or infused with rhythm and whip-like force. So if you, again, if you look at this painting, I think you can see the combination of Art Nouveau as well as the principles of symbolism, this dreamlike, I, I mean, what, is this a real, is this really happening? Or is a peacock right next to her like this, flowing in the breeze with her? I doubt it, but again, it doesn't matter. The idea is that it's taking a, a dreamlike setting and painting it. Um, as I said, Amanjan and Seurat were both students together. They shared a studio in 1879. Um, and this work by Seurat, incidentally, was shown in the Paris Salon of 1883. It was the first work to be exhibited by Seurat. And even though it isn't pointillist, which he is known for, if you look very closely, you can see he's working towards that. Just wanted to show you a work by Amand Jean called Nature More, which means still life. And again, he was the teacher of Gibbs and we saw Gibbs is still life, so he borrowed from it. Now, I paired uh, Gibbs's still life with um, a work by Andre Durand because when he was in France on that second visit, he also exhibited with Matisse, Seurat, and Durand. And um, indicative, indicative of the time, which is a little anecdote here, while he was passing through Italy on his way to France, his paints were squeezed dry to check for contraband. So can you imagine he's this, this young artist going to France and he's got his paints and they're all gone because they were worried what he was sneaking across the border. Anyway, this is not a typical work by Durand. Durand was a fauve, which means he painted nature not in its true colors, but I chose this one because it's a similar in subject to that of the painting of Gibbs that we're talking about. And um, even though it's not the same, you can see that that was a popular subject at the time. Okay. On the left, we have Gibbs, the Jewish lady from 1928. And because he exhibited with Matisse, I wanted you to see a Matisse that I thought was not exactly the same, but showing a woman in a close-up, Matisse's odalisque with gray pants. Um, as I said, he also exhibited with Matisse at this time. And Matisse was in his, in his pattern phase. Um, if you know anything about Matisse, he grew up um, 
in, in, a, in a, a town not too far from Paris where they were into textiles and fabrics. His parents were both um, uh, involved with that. So pattern was a big part of his life. But I thought the, um, the painting, the way the women are sort of in the forefront staring at you was kind of a neat comparison. This is another painting by Gibbs of that time from 1928, French nude, and I compared it with a painting by Carl Schmidt Rotluff, which is called Nude from 1914. Now, when I saw this painting on the left, I immediately thought of the German Expressionists, and Schmidt Rotloff was one of those German Expressionists. The German Expressionist movement reached its peak during the 1920s, beginning several years before the First World War. It included new modes of painting, literature, theater, dance, film, architecture, and music. And it was really defined by intense emotions of angst and frustration. And um, these works tended to emphasize individualism. Um, a lot of it was a reaction to the German experience before and during and after World War I. Uh, they suffered uh, tremendously, believe it or not, even though they were the instigators of the war, if you know your history, and the country was in complete disarray, and uh, the art of the time really reflected this, as art does. Art is just a function of our times. So turning this atmosphere of anger, despair, and longing into creative energy, the German Expressionists pushed forth new techniques and approaches to the human form. So the human body appears frequently in, their, in the, their works, bent into new angles and shapes through experiments in perspective and depiction. And I think that this is a perfect painting to show that. But there's also a, um, a darkness, if you will, okay, an intense emotional reaction that one can see in this painting and one gets from it. And if you look at what uh, Gibbs did. This isn't exactly warm and fuzzy art right here. So I think that um, you can see that he was also affected by this movement and I think quite profoundly in a great deal of his work. Um, I chose this work by the German expressionist um, Kirchner because again I think it exemplifies the German Expressionist movement and also harkens to what Gibbs would do 15 years later when he saw it. It's Ernst Ludwig Kirchner's nude woman combing her hair. Now, this young female body, it's expected to be attractive and beautiful. Okay, I would say that's hardly the case, right? She's awkward, she's um, very generic and uh, not at all attractive. He forces us to lose her nude body while we want to see it. Um, she's looking into a mirror. She's got an attendant here. Okay, I don't know if you can see it, but there are two, two behind her. Um, an elderly woman helps her here. There are two women behind her. Um, they are here, but they are marginalized by the centrality of her presence. And again, even though she's not attractive, she's a very strong figure. And I would say the same thing for Gibbs's nude. One more comparison in German Expressionism. Here's our Jewish lady again. And here's a painting by Max Beckmann, who happens to be one of my favorites. Um, this is a portrait of Quapi. Quapi was his wife. And it's Quapi in blue. And again, you've got these very strong emotional faces, okay? This is in-your-face kind of art, and I think it's coincidental they're wearing the blue dresses together, but I think you can see that when Gibbs saw some of this work, this is what he ended up doing. Okay, so Gibbs returns to Boston, and as I told you, he moved to Harwich, actually Harwich Port, in 1930. Well, according to an interview in November of 2014 with Brewster Historical Society member Beth Finch and Gibbs's daughter Katie, he lived in Harwich on Bank Street in an antique shop in the early days. He joined the Public Works Art Project, a government relief agency, training young painters and forming a close artistic 
community. And some of that was during Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. Well, since he was tied up with Provincetown, okay, um, his friends and milieu extended to Provincetown. Peter Hunt, <clears throat> Edwin Dickinson, Ross Moffat, Carl Naths, and Arnold Geisbuehler were all important artists and forward thinkers of their day. They were Gibbs's peers and his drinking pals. And so I chose to take an earlier <clears throat> painting by him, the Bermuda Street that you saw before, and compare it with something that he did a few years later of a Provincetown street. And again, he's got this vivid color, he's got the use of outline, that black outline. Um, it's very strong, powerful, and again, I'm going to use the phrase, in your face kind of art. Now, five years later, in, in 1944, the Gibbs family found a house in Brewster. And what house was it? It was the Elijah Cobb house, believe it or not. And there's our tie-in, our connection with Howard Gibbs. They bought it from a family by the name of Duvenick, who lived in California. And if you go back in the history of the Cobb house, uh, Caro Dugan, who was the great-granddaughter of Elijah Cobb, worked as a governess, if you will, for the Duvenick family. And when, when Caro died, she left the house to the Duvenicks. So the Gibbs family bought it from the Duvenicks because they were in California. When Gibbs bought the house, there was no electricity, water, or heat. There were snakes in the house, and there were huge amounts of plaster that had fallen down. <clears throat> Gibbs spent the first year, all winter, putting in a heating system. Remember, this is from his daughter from the interview, all this information. Um, and it was difficult because it was during World War II. In 1945, they moved in and sort of camped out in there while they were still working on the house. I can relate to that. I did that in my first house in New Jersey. Katie moved there as a child, that's their daughter, and started school in Brewster in 1946 in the third grade. Now, in Brewster, Gibbs' painting style transitioned to the emotional and spontaneous. He painted to please himself, applying thick paint in bright, splattered colors. And we're going to see that as we move on. One thing I wanted to show you was, I said Ross Moffat from um, Provincetown was one of his drinking buddies and friends. And this is a, uh, one of the paintings that Moffat did um, in Provincetown called The Road Builders. Um, one of the uh, talks that I did up at the Provincetown Art Association Museum, uh, I think it was a year and a half ago, um, I took some of the paintings from their permanent collection and compared them with works uh, that are iconic works that I knew and others would know. And this one I compared with, um, with um, oh my God, Thomas Hart Benton. So I think you can see that. Anyway, I didn't want to go too much off on a tangent there, but uh, Moffat was an American artist specializing in landscape painting. Uh, after the war, he returned to Provincetown and in 1924 established the Provincetown painting class with fellow artist Heinrich Pfeiffer. And he was one of the founders of the Provincetown Art Association and a leading figure in the town's art scene. So a good friend for Gibbs to have. Just want to show you very quickly two other paintings by Ross Moffat, and they are both part of Provincetown Art Association Museum, better known as PAM's Permanent Collection. And uh, I particularly love this Boats in Wellfleet Harbor. I think that's, that's really quite special. But again, you can see the variety of ways that, that Moffat worked, because these are so different from each other. Okay, the, these and several other paintings that follow will be Gibbs's paintings that he did in Provincetown. <clears throat> but before I show them all to you, and this Two Cottages is one of them, I want to compare it with the work of Gabriel Munter, who did Kohel's Snowy Landscape with Houses in 1909. She also, a woman, a female artist, very avant-garde. She was a German Expressionist painter who was at the forefront of the Munich avant-garde in the early 20th century. She studied and lived with the painter Vasily Kandinsky. 
and was a founding member of the expressionist group called Der Blau Reiter, which is the Blue Rider. She connected themes of primitivism and modernity in her paintings. Um, and again, she painted about Germany before, during, and after World War I. And I think if you look, you can see that these paintings that were seen by Gibbs when he was studied in Europe are definitely reflected in his work. So we looked at this one. Let's go on. Here's two more of, of paintings from Provincetown. House with Boat, which is a similar idea with the outlining and the powerful kind of um, uh, strong colors and so forth. And then this imaginary landscape, which I thought was very, had harkened back to that symbolism, that dreamlike state of, of, of painting that he had learned when he was in Paris studying with Amand Jean. I just loved this painting that he did of Paris from 1928. I just loved it. And I thought I would compare it with a work by Kandinsky called Murnau Street with Women. Again, you've got Kandinsky's a little bit more um, using, I think, maybe some fauve where he's, he's got the, the unnatural colors, colors not true necessarily to nature, but the way he made the street and the houses and the angles of the roofs and so forth, I think that, I think uh, Gibbs borrowed a little bit from that as well. Now the work from Gibbs' time abroad is a little more polished, a little more European. The urban landscapes from Paris are lovely and there's a comedic drama in the simple bulbous forms of his portraits from this period. Again, I'll go back to the Jewish lady. Perhaps more important, what this time gave him was exposure to new ways of thinking, ways that would eventually become his own way of thinking. And again, Vasily Kandinsky was a pioneer of abstract art. So Gibbs is getting exposed to so many, many things when he's over in Europe. Okay. On the left, we have Gibbs's bouquet to a dead hero, which I'm going to describe to you in a moment, but I compared it with the painting of Marc Chagall, The Woman and the Roses. Um, Chagall, of course, uh, putting a woman on top of a bouquet of flowers is, of course, not reality, but then again, Chagall took reality and put a dreamlike spin on all of his work. And most likely this is Bella, who was his love and his wife. And uh, he's showing her nude. There's a little bit of provocativeness about this. But again, using the flowers, and here we've got a woman with flowers, yet it's called Bouquet to a Dead Hero. So let's take a look at this one. All right. You first see, um, see this in Bouquet to a Dead Hero, an ominous title for a painting that plays out like, um, again, like a Chagall painting. There's a girl ensnared in a bouquet of flowers. Here she is, right? While beneath her, if you look very closely, there exists a dark underworld with a demonic looking figure crouched in the shadows. What is going on there? Hmm? At some point in the 1940s, Gibbs seemed to, seems to have thrown caution to the wind and started painting images gathered not from cognitive sources, but psychological ones. Again, the symbolist influence. Art must be concerned with the inner truth rather than the objective imagery, he said. Taken to heart, it's a gateway to Gibbs's interior world. Gone are the clean, flat shapes and color contrasts of his earlier work. And you have to admit, this does not look anything like those houses from Provincetown, the Jewish lady, um, any of those earlier paintings, even the Bermuda Street. It's completely different. There's an anything goes quality of often dark, murky surfaces infused with a cacophony of detail. Look at all of the detail on the flowers. And yet, this is. Yeah, somewhat sketchy, her face. There's some detail, but look at the background. Very, very sketchy. 
He ups the ante in the scale. He's, um, he's now doing five to six foot canvases and he's putting religious and allegorical imagery, rapacious skeletons, which we'll see later, and fleshed out stick figures with webbed feet. So everything is changing. So this painting, literally in 1942, marked a transition for Gibbs. This is called the Blessing of the Fleet, and if you know anything about Provincetown, you know it's an annual event that's done um, to make sure that the fishing fleet has a successful season. Well, his first one-man show in Boston at the Stewart Gallery in 1946 was reviewed enthusiastically, uh, one critic calling Gibbs, and I quote, whimsical in satire, grotesque in humor, and extraordinary in his jewel-like use of color. His work is sheer delight. That was an interesting quote to me because I'm not sure that these later paintings necessarily evoke delight, at least for me. I think they're extraordinarily interesting and definitely worth seeing, but they're a little disturbing too in their quality, at least for me. So this is the blessing of the fleet, and as an artist painting solely for himself, he reputedly liked to work in the dark of night while listening to jazz, and this is very interesting. His paintings are full of spontaneous passages poured and dripped across a roomy expanse that's perfect for stretching out the imagination. The line is anxious, the layers are deep, and the color dense. And you could just, the description there, of spontaneous passages and poured and dripped paint and so forth just sounds like jazz to me. So as he's listening to the music, you can almost see him painting some of these next paintings. It sort of reminds me of Jackson Pollock dripping, but it's not really fully dripping, of course. He does have, and I'm going to point out to you, here's the, the, um, the figure who is blessing. If you see the, the boats in the harbor, the perspective is very odd, but nonetheless, he's blessing the fleet. So you can still make out. It's abstract, but not completely abstract. You can still make out what he's painting here, but let's go on. Well, I see something that looks familiar here. Um, this is called Untitled from 1950. Gibbs sought to reveal his own emotional landscape, often through dark and grotesque figures, using thickly applied and spattered paint in vivid colors. And I think this is a great example of what I just read, but not only that, you could see him listening to jazz, painting this one, right? He's all over the place here. And when you think of his early work, you can see how he has changed. Here's another one, different aspects of my dealer. Now, you can certainly see faces, two recognizable faces here, and something that looks somewhat like a body, but look at all of this here, okay? And again, this work is um, three feet by four feet, so he's grown a bit in his size. Gibbs' work has appeared in group shows at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston and the Museum of Modern Art, the Whitney Museum of American Art, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. His last group exhibition was in 1986 at what is now the Cape Cod Museum of Art in Dennis. This is a self-portrait from around 1950. And I've seen, in, in doing my research on many artists, I have seen many self-portraits. And some of them are true to life, and some of them are not. And this one, while I can see a face and a body, hardly true, true to life. And so I'm going back um, to borrow again from my, my lecture at the Provincetown Art Museum. And this is done, uh, this is part of their permanent collection by an artist named Robert uh, Beauchamp. It's untitled, but it is a self-portrait. And <laughs> you can see the eyes, a little suggestion of a nose, but the rest of it, you can see some hair, but oh my. So you can see how artists have really I think a good time. It looks like they're having a good time to me doing these self-portraits. Beauchamp, incidentally, was an American figurative painter and arts educator. His paintings and drawings are known for depicting dramatic creatures and figures with expressionistic colors. 
His work was described in the New York Times as being both frightening and amusing. I think it's a perfect description. And in a way, I'm going to say the same thing about Gibbs's self-portrait. I think it's a little frightening and amusing too. This is from 1951, Study for the Minotaur. Now, you've got some recognizable figures here. It looks like a woman with a child. And uh, this I am not totally sure. I also see a creature back here, which could be the Minotaur. But let me read to you what I have on this. While his work could take on a disquieting expressionism, by all accounts, Gibbs was a happy family man, and his work could be equally playful and whimsical. There's a doodle-like drawing of mystical animals that he drew for his daughter Catherine, that's Katie, and other drawings show a confluence of upturned smiles and benign curves. A major work like The Study for the Minotaur expands on that playful, doodle-like quality. It's a wonderful painting packed with such a curious wealth of subtle details. It's like a dozen paintings in one. It's been described as that. And again, it shows his later playful doodle-like style. He shed a dark palette for an airy expanse of blue in which to set his totem-like figures, because in a way they are. It's one of the best works um, to show a perfect union of discipline and openness, a lot like jazz. And Gibbs was very fond of jazz, as I told you. Um, in fact, he spent many nights in jazz clubs with his family and friends. And that interview with his daughter Katie that I uh, mentioned before, she remembers growing up sitting in jazz clubs with, with um, her parents and other art figures of the day. Well, here we come full circle to our Elijah Cobb house, which was built in 1799. Um, we know that um, it's a, an example of Georgian architecture. It was the home of Captain Elijah Cobb, a colorful skipper, skipper who left his memoirs. Um, it's a two-story house uh, topped by a captain's walk, and it still stands on Lower Road. And we know it's the headquarters of the Brewster Historical Society. Well, the construction of the house was mentioned by Captain Cobb in his memoirs, and I quote, This year, 1799, the beloved Washington, the father of our country, died. This year, our first son was born. This year, I took possession of the farm, built up my house, and the family moved into it on New Year's Day, 1800. Well, when Cobb's great-granddaughter, Caroline Dugan, known as Caro, died in 1941, the property left the Cobb family. And as I told you, it went, she, she willed it to the Duvenix. At the time of um, uh, its purchase in 1945 by noted artist Howard Gibbs for $10,000, by the way, the house sat on 23 acres of land. And as I described to you before, it had fallen into tremendous disrepair between the plaster and the snakes and everything else. Gibbs restored it, but he used historic paint colors he mixed himself, which is very interesting, to keep the look of the house. When the roof was redone, the access to the widow's walk was sealed. A portion of an L, which actually was a separate building, moved to the location, but since removed in the 90s when the house was taken over and refurbished by the Historical Society, um, had a carriage shed attached to it. And that carriage shed was where Gibbs had his studio. So that's why I wanted to point that out to you. He also moved an old duck blind to the bluff, the earlier beach house long gone. The family often picnicked there and Gibbs would sketch there. He also added the section known today as the carriage house to the outbuilding. This is an old photo of that duck blind. And the man pictured here is Cornelius Chennery. And Chennery was a boarder in the Cobb House in the days when Caro and her mother lived there. They took boarders in to, to offset the cost of maintaining the house. And uh, he was a photographer. Supposedly he gave Caro lessons, but there's family lore that said that they had a romantic relationship as well. But it's interesting because Caro never married. So this might have been her one shot, but whatever. <laughs> <clears throat> there was a house right on the beach that had been a duck blind on the pond. 
So what they did, according to Katie in her interview, they floated the house across the pond, would you believe, dragged it up the hill and put it on the bluff. And there it is. And as I said, Gibbs sometimes used this as a temporary studio. He would draw but he would never paint there. He painted in the carriage shed. Okay, this is a photo of Windmill Village, and the reason I, it's a current photo, and the reason I wanted to show you this is that Gibbs's wife, Margaret, or Peggy as she was known, Gibbs, inherited the Cobb House property in 1970 after Howard's death at age 65. She served as Brewster Historical Society president in the 1970s and was instrumental in acquiring, moving, and restoring the Higgins Farmed Windmill, now located at the Society's Windmill Village. This is our current, a current, a picture of the house with our sign, the Brewster Historical Society Museum. Um, daughter Catherine, or uh, as she was known as Katie Gibbs, inherited this home on her mother's death in 1975. In 1977, she added a final L to the outbuilding that included a chicken house and farm stand. Eventually, the property, as I said, was broken up and sold, leaving the Cobb House and one and a half acres of land in 1986. Catherine Gibbs died in 2019. This is our last slide called The Game, and um, I just want to add that Gibbs's work today forms a cornerstone of the Cape Cod Museum of Arts collection. His work can also be found in the collections of the Addison Gallery of American Art in Andover, Mass., the Museum of, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, the de Cordova Museum in Lincoln, Mass., and the Staten Island Museum in New York. And I just want to repeat the quote from Howard Gibbs that said, art must be concerned with the inner truth rather than objective imagery. Well, you've been a wonderful audience, as I always say to all of my, at the end of all of my talks, because my audiences are always wonderful. I hope you have enjoyed our little foray into the world of Howard Gibbs's art and his connection to Brewster, and of course, our Brewster Historical Society. Thank you all for watching, and I hope to see you again soon.